Welcome to a very special presentation of the novel A Really Good Day by James Hosek. On its surface, it's a story about a remarkable round of golf. But if you're not a golfer, if you quickly change the channel, if you accidentally come upon a tournament on TV, I encourage you to listen anyway. It's a story about family and friendship. It's a story about redemption and second chances. It's a story about promises made and promises kept. It's a story about once-in-a-lifetime experiences. But most of all, it is one man's love letter to his family. That man was my brother, the author, James Hosek. Aside from being an amazing veterinarian, woodworker, gardener, husband, father, brother, son, and friend, he was a writer. Writers are often told to write what they know. And in this, his first book, he did that in more ways than I can count. It will make you laugh. It will make you cry. And it will make you stand up and cheer. So sit back and enjoy as Jim takes you on a fun, entertaining journey through 18 holes of golf and one man's really good day. Chapter 5 Third Hole Mr. Hanover, you still hold honors, the tournament official informed him. Scott Hanover stood off to the side of the tee for a moment. It seemed like the exhilaration of the previous hole had completely erased the long water hazard lining the right half of the hole from his memory. Paul had removed Scott's six iron from the bag and held it out to him. Scott, Paul muttered, trying to shake him from the trance. It's not there. No water ball today, buddy. Scott smiled. No water ball today, he echoed. Water balls were so named by amateur golfers because you wouldn't mind losing them in a water hazard if you happen to hit a bad shot from the tee. Why send a brand new $2 Top Flight XL 7000 to an early watery grave if you had a slightly used Titleist you fished from another water hazard that wouldn't be missed? Scott had an early predilection to hitting balls into the water, hence his nickname, Duck. The name still stuck with him, as Paul had reminded him earlier with the special Duck logo balls. At some point, Scott realized that the balls he used as water balls were probably a previous golfer's water ball. Maybe there was a reason it had ended up in the water in the first place. Perhaps they were damaged or waterlogged or just plain bad balls. Why not use your best ball if you needed to clear the water on a tee shot? Hitting someone else's cast off was just asking for trouble. It wasn't a bad way to approach life either. Why put your worst foot forward in the worst situations, hoping to cut your losses if things went badly? You needed to approach each situation in life with your best foot forward. Step into the future with confidence, and the best outcome was assured. Scott reached into his pocket and retrieved a ball and a tee. Some golfers skipped the tee when teeing off with an iron, but Scott sank his nearly flush with the ground letting his ball sit above the ground a quarter of an inch. It made it easier to get under the ball with the club. He set his ball and then stepped back. The safest shot was to aim at the left side of the green, keeping the water hazard along the right as far out of play as possible. Unfortunately, this would end him up on the opposite side of the green from the pin. If he aimed for the pin, then the ball would have to travel a good distance directly over the water. Paul stepped up behind him. Do you think you can do it? He asked, reading Scott's mind. Not after the tee shot on that last hole, he answered. Don't remember your tee shot. Remember your last shot, advised Paul. Just hit it nice and easy and keep to the left. Scott nodded in agreement and lined up to face the left side of the green. With any luck, he'd have a little slice or fade and the ball would end up in the center of the green no more than five yards from the pin. At worst, he'd chip on with his second shot and get himself close enough for a one-putt. He stepped up just short of the ball and took a practice swing. The club swished the air, 
barely brushing the short cropped grass of the tea box. He took another practice swing, and it felt just as mechanically sound as the first. He stepped up to the ball, took a deep breath, and exhaled. Then he released the hold on the club and leaned back in his stance. Something was missing, and he knew what it was. But did he dare? Here? He turned to Paul. You're dying to say it, aren't you? he asked. Well, equivocated Paul, it is appropriate for the whole, if not the situation at large. I think I need it, Paul. Are you sure? Go ahead. Paul looked around at the confused onlookers, rather embarrassed, but not as embarrassed as he soon would be. Quack, he quacked. Scott laughed and shook his head. Just what I needed, he said. Yeah, thought Paul. It had to be done, buddy. What are you doing? asked an annoyed Jerry Spaulding. Hit the ball already. The official shushed him and shot Scott a warning glance as well. Scott composed himself. He prayed this ball would not end up as someone else's water ball. He took one more practice swing and stepped up to the tee. Quack, he thought, and pulled the club back. A part of his mind was thinking what he needed to do to keep the ball straight, but he wasn't aware of it. His six iron should put the ball out there between 165 and 175 yards from the tee. The club swung down with the same mechanical precision as his practice swings. As he hit the ball, Scott let his eyes follow it out over the left side of the fairway to land precisely where he had aimed. It hadn't pulled the least bit to the right, and he had a long 15-yard putt to make a birdie. A fairly easy two-putt for the par. Paul took the club and patted his shoulder. You're dry, Scott, he assured him. Dry as can be, agreed Scott. It'll be a tester, Paul pointed out, referring to the long putt Scott had just left himself. I studied all night, Scott said. Jerry Spaulding nodded his approval at the shot and took his turn at the tee. He was using a seven iron, confident he had the distance to reach the green comfortably. He didn't use a tee and placed the ball carefully on the ground. With perhaps too much confidence, he wound up and swung. A huge clod of grass obscured the flight of the ball for a moment. The grass landed twenty yards out, and the ball plopped nicely in the middle of the pond. Paul whispered to Scott. He used a water ball. Most definitely, agreed Scott. With grim determination, Jerry pulled another ball from his pocket and let it fall onto the teeing area. He lined up and swung for the second time. The ball soared in a beautiful arc right at the pin. It stuck and gave a slight bounce to finish no more than six inches from the hole. He shook his head from side to side staring at the small white speck on the green. If it had been his first shot, he would have birdied the hole and likely tied Scott for the lead. As it was, he was sitting at three, having to take a penalty stroke for going into the hazard, and he would sink the ball on his fourth shot. Pete took a little more time getting ready with his shot, and he landed on the far right side of the green, inches away from the water, but in good position to attempt to birdie himself. Pete's caddy took the outstretched club, exchanging it for a putter as the whole group started walking for the green. When they reached it, a nod from Scott and Pete told Jerry it was okay to play his shot out of order. Normally, the player furthest from the hole would hit first, but Jerry just needed to tap it in and he was done. His caddy lifted the pin and before he took two steps, Jerry knocked his ball in with a careless one-handed putt. Ellie Burke shook her head at Spaulding's cavalier attitude to the putt. She had seen many golfers miss a short putt doing just the same thing. A tournament like this was not the place to take a double bogey for no reason. She walked around the green to the back right, near the path to the fourth tee, to set up to tape Scott's putts. Scott was obviously next. Although he had little hope of sinking it, he took the time to read the green carefully. Despite having made it to the green in one shot, the water hazard was still in play behind the hole. If he judged the speed of the green wrong, he could roll right past the hole and into the water. 
If he hit it too softly, he'd have no chance of making par. Paul stood behind them as they both eyed the shot. Just hit it in, was Paul's only words of wisdom. Be the ball, he added once again, quoting a famous line from Caddyshack. Be the ball, echoed Scott. He took his time and lined up his putt, and took his three practice swings to fine-tune the speed of the putter. He stepped up to the ball and sighed out a deep breath. He remembered a tip he had absorbed from watching a golf tournament on television once. The pro advised not to follow the ball when you hit it as you could throw the direction of your club face off. He pulled the club back, even with his right toe, and pushed it through, keeping his eyes focused on the spot where the ball once was. His club ended up a few inches past his left toe, and he stood frozen. The crowd around the third green had become automatically silent as Scott putted. As he stood looking at the grass, he realized how unsilent it really was. There were subtle noises all around, ignored by his conscious mind most of the time. But at this moment, he was aware of every single one of them. Leaves on a tree to his right rustled in the wind. A sparrow chirped behind him. A muffled cry of delight could be heard from a golfer on the first or second hole. A ball plunked neatly into a cup. A ball plunked neatly into a cup? Scott slowly turned his head to the left. His ball was not visible. Had it gone in, or was it so far off course that it wasn't even on the green anymore? Perhaps it went into the water after all. Then he saw Jerry Spaulding on the far side of the green. He was standing next to the camera woman, muttering in disbelief. Ellie was smiling. She let her camera fall and gave Scott a thumbs up. Scott walked across the green to the hole. He looked in at the yellow duck on the white ball sitting calmly at the bottom, waiting for him to pull it out. You should always take my advice, said Paul, still holding the flag stick in his hand. What's that? asked Scott. I told you to just hit it in. It wasn't as far as his putt two weeks before, but sinking a shot that long wasn't a common experience for him. He thought he just might stop watching all his putts from now on. Pete took the time to compliment him on the shot and lined up his own putt, hoping to equal Scott's score on the hole, if not the way he did it. His putt broke to the left. Head hung with disappointment, he walked over and, with more care than Jerry had shown, tapped the ball in the final eight inches or so for a par. You tape that? Scott asked Ellie. She nodded and patted the side of the camera. Scott smiled. The man with the walkie-talkie was making his report. The board with the leading scores was now up. Scott still led with a minus two after three holes. There were two other players at minus one, one after one hole and the other after two holes. Jerry and Pete were fourth and fifth with ease after their names. Scott could bogey the next two holes and still be shooting par for the round. If he could only keep from having a disaster hole, he'd finish with a nice respectable score. A great way to end the golf season. Who knew? In four or five years when the kid was in school, he'd start coming out again with Paul. Maybe enter some more tournaments. For the first time, he wished Sarah was there to share it with him. He knew she didn't care much about golf, but maybe she'd be proud of how he was doing so far. He hoped the tape from the red-headed camera woman would turn out okay. Without it, who would believe he was playing so well? Jason dialed the number into his phone again and waited about five rings before it was picked up. Yeah? muttered the voice on the other end, seemingly angry at the disturbance. What's going on? asked Jason. The kid is still leading. Don't you have something better to do than keep bothering me? Aren't you supposed to be covering some golf tournament? Well, my camera girl is off getting useless footage, and the best guy isn't due to tee off for another two hours. I should still be in bed. What were they thinking sending me out here so early? Maybe Lucy just wants you away from the marathon and got Keith Kelly to hide you as far away as she could. I think you're absolutely right. By the time the leaders finish the marathon and Lucy gets her story, this thing will likely just be getting started. There won't be even any scraps for me. With this high school kid out of nowhere, 
They have another team getting some background on them right now. You know, track coach, neighbors, other kids. We'll probably eat up most of the evening report. Tremendous, said Jason. This god-awful tournament will hit the garbage can as soon as I walk in the door. Why am I wasting my time? Maybe you can get nine holes in, joked the man on the other end. Ha ha. If you weren't such a great cameraman, I'd hang up on you. Well, I'm going to have to hang up on you. It looks like Lucy is going to have us move to the next location. Later, buddy. The cell phone went dead in Jason's hand. He slipped it back into the inside pocket of his jacket and crushed the empty paper coffee cup in his hand. He glanced at the scorecard outside and quite a few golfers and other onlookers had gathered to see the latest postings. About a dozen golfers had scores to post and the numbers were starting to fill the board. Most seemed to be pointing at the placard listing the leader so far. Hanover S. His score was posted as minus two. Not bad, he thought, for just three holes. Then he saw it. Suspended from the ceiling in the far corner was a 35-inch TV, not doing anything. He walked up to it, reached for the power switch, and turned it on. Maybe he could catch a glimpse of the marathon and this out-of-nowhere kid who was making the Kenyan sweat. At least it would take his mind off this miserable day. When Jake first saw her, he thought he was having a hallucination, maybe some withdrawal symptoms from the alcohol. A red convertible had pulled into the parking lot and slid illegally next to the last car in the row nearest the clubhouse, partially blocking the driveway. The car was different, but the woman getting out of it was all too familiar. She wore a lemon-yellow suit over a white blouse. Her hair was cut short, and her legs were cut long. It was Karen Blakely, another of the agents that worked for Fraser and Frakes. Horror gripped Jake, and he backed up past the scoreboard. He was pretty sure she hadn't seen him. He cursed himself for perhaps the hundredth time for never getting himself a cell phone. He looked around and saw the payphone by the pull carts lined up on the far side of the clubhouse, amazed that they still had one. But then he realized these courses were mostly frequented by senior golfers, the group least likely to have cell phones. He walked over, leaned into the booth, dropped two quarters into the coin slot, and dialed Jonathan's office number. Hello, answered Jones. What is she doing here? The silence on the other end told Jake that Jonathan knew exactly whom he meant by she. Jake, I just found out about it. I'm glad you called. When are you going to get a cell phone? Jake interrupted the inquiry. This isn't some competition, is it? Tell me she's just a huge golf fan and is here to watch the tournament. April found out I was sending you and went to Freaks. She convinced him this was too big a deal to trust you, and Frakes had her send out Karen as a sort of backup. I'm sorry. So in case I mess up, she steps in? She won't bother waiting. She'll just go right for him. You need to get to him first. Tell me you've talked to Patterson. I've talked to his caddy. The great one himself has disappeared. Hey, if you can get him first, you get the deal. Frakes will have to let you be his agent. This stinks, Jonathan. Karen Blakely being here doesn't do a lot for my confidence. Jake, you have to believe me. I want this for you. I know you can do it. Sign Andrew Patterson, and we can rub it in April Weinstein and Frakes' faces. This is what you're good at, my friend. Jake hung the phone up firmly. What was the point? Patterson was never going to sign with him. Karen Blakely was his style. Jonathan should never have sent him here. Anger and frustration wiped away the remains of his earlier resolve, and the overwhelming desire for the numbness that could only be found at the bottom of a bottle of vodka overtook him. He'd go to his car, find a liquor store or a grocery store or even a drug store, any place that could sell him booze this early in the morning. He rustled back past the crowd at the scoreboard, and looked towards the parking lot. There was his little Geo Metro, a far cry from Karen Blake's Mercedes convertible, but it fit him just fine. With single-minded determination, he walked down the sidewalk past the starter's table through a crowd of golfers and caddies. 
As he re-emerged, he found himself almost colliding with a neatly dressed woman in a yellow suit. Sorry, he muttered automatically before his brain registered the situation. Hey, watch where you're going, cautioned the woman. Her expression of annoyance turned to glee as Karen Blakely recognized Jake. Well, she continued, already signed Mr. Nickers, she asked jokingly. Hey, you want him? He's all yours, Jake answered. Jake, honey, with you on the case, there was never any doubt. She turned ahead for the starter's table. Undoubtedly, Frakes had phoned ahead and her credentials were waiting for her. He turned and continued towards his car. He loosened his tie and pulled it off. He felt his pockets and located his car keys and licked his lips, tasting the burning, numbing liquid that would soon be anesthetizing his throat and his soul. He stuck the key in the door, popped the lock, and opened it. He sat down, and with his hand trembling and tears starting to form in his eyes, he jabbed the key unsuccessfully at the ignition until he threw them at the dashboard in utter frustration and anger. He popped open the glove compartment, hoping he had stashed some cigarettes in there to help him calm his nerves. He was reminded of the movie Airplane, and thought to himself he sure had picked the wrong day to quit drinking and smoking. He slammed the door shut and groped around for his keys. Then he saw it, the white corner of the photograph, he didn't even need to take it down from its spot above the visor to know he wasn't going to the liquor store. He wasn't going home. His first test of faith in himself, and he had almost failed. Almost. A memory came to him from the night before, which until now had been a blank. It was vivid and real, like he was reliving it. Gina had taken him home after he drank too much at dinner, and probably embarrassed the heck out of her again. Sometime between her helping him get settled in his apartment and her leaving, she had asked him a question. Where are you, darling? She spoke to him as if he wasn't in the room, like she was talking to herself. I'll be here when you get back, she promised. Don't give up on me. She wasn't worried he'd let her go, but that he'd lose himself further into a self-induced walking coma, or worse, kill himself with neglect and self-loathing. He was lost, lost in his own mind for the last year, trapped in a maze of guilt and denial, and, most of all, fear. But if he could keep on navigating through it, he knew Gina was waiting for him at the end. There couldn't be that many more wrong turns to make before he was out. Still, his body wanted a drink, despite his mind's determination to the contrary. He had been here dozens of times before, and knew that one drink wasn't all he would have. The effects of the alcohol and nicotine withdrawal were coming to light. The last vestiges of both drugs were leaving his system, and, without them, his body would be in confusion for a while. But he could fight it. He really only had one thing to concentrate on. Sign Andrew Patterson. After that, he could go home, or even better, stop off at some greasy diner and celebrate with a cheeseburger, chocolate milkshake, and fries. Nothing like eating to take your mind off smoking. No, he would call Gina and tell her what he had done and apologize and mean it. He wanted her here now. Just the sight of her would bolster his resolve. But he would have to settle for a mental image of her. Not only how she looked, but the sound of her voice, the scent of her hair, the taste of her lips, the touch of her skin. If he went and had that drink now, all of that would be gone, and he wouldn't blame her one bit. He saw the keys near an empty Burger King bag on the floor of the passenger side. He scooped them up and pulled himself out of the car again, this time with more ease. Then he reached back in and pulled the photograph from the visor, tucking it into the breast pocket on his shirt without looking at it. With both Gina and Brad as his guardian angels, he could do this. He had to. Karen was good. 
but Jake still remembered what it took to be good at this job. It was a job he loved, and he needed it as much as Gina to bring him back to life, or rather bring life back to him. He noted Karen Blakely disappearing into the clubhouse. Her yellow suit was easy to pick out from a distance. Where was Patterson? He wondered. Someone like him would stand out louder than Karen Blakely. Well, he had that jump on her. He knew what to look for. But Karen wouldn't be behind for long. He locked the car and started to jog back to the clubhouse. That was a bad idea. Within fifty yards, he was walking again, and now panting on top of that. What had he done to himself the last year? He spotted Eric Peters lounging with some other caddies. Eric, he puffed. Have you seen Patterson? Nah, don't expect to for a while. He isn't planning on starting his warm-up for another hour or so. Where might he be? Your guess is as good as mine, speculated the young man. When he disappears like this, I just relax and wait. Some of the other caddies chuckled as if they had heard this story before. Where will he warm up then? Over by the driving range, Eric indicated with a sweep of his right arm. Listen, if some woman comes asking for him, send her off somewhere to give me some time to talk to him. Gee, I don't know, mister, said Eric, less than subtly. Once again, his comment evoked a chuckle from the caddies. Jake pulled out his wallet and found a twenty wedged between some singles and a five. He handed it to Eric. I'd really appreciate it. Eric turned the bill over in his hand and pocketed it. I'll see what I can do, he offered. Thanks, said Jake, relieved to have an ally. He walked back to the scoreboard, leaving the caddies to their sweet-smelling cigarettes and stories. As soon as he was out of earshot, one of the caddies asked Eric, Hey, Peters, how much did the lady give you to send that guy chasing gooses? A hundred, he answered. They all broke out in laughter again. Gina let the phone ring. She counted four rings, then listened to hear the voice on the answering machine. She suspected it would be Jake, but she thought it might be too early for him. The glowing numbers on the clock read 8.45 a.m. Uh, hi, started the voice tentatively, as if he was deciding whether or not to leave a message. This is Jonathan Jones from Fraser and Frakes. Gina laughed to herself. She had met Jonathan perhaps a dozen times, and even been to his house for dinner, but he still acted like he needed to introduce himself. I think I may have messed up a deal with Jake, and I was hoping you might give me a call and see if we can make sure I didn't make things worse. I'll be in my office. Gina didn't wait for him to finish and grabbed the phone. Jonathan, she said sleepily, I'm here. Oh, great. I need to talk to you. I heard... Something about Jake? I gave him a job today. A decent commission on the back end and a chance to maybe get back into things. But I think, I know, my boss sent a backup in case he messed up. It's an important account and they think Jake will, well, you know. I know, muttered Gina. She sat up and rubbed her face, letting her hand brush back through her long auburn hair. She could still smell smoke in it and knew she wouldn't be able to fall asleep again until she washed it. Last night she was too tired and too frustrated with Jake to notice. He was pretty quick last night. When he gets going, I seem to lose whatever progress I've made bringing him back. How did he sound to you? He sounded up for it, like he was ready to take a step forward, commented Jonathan. That's good, I guess. Well, that was until I talked to him a few minutes ago at the golf course. Golf course? There's a regional amateur golf tournament. The winner gets to play in the next Pro-Am Invitational. There's a fellow, Andrew Patterson, who was a shoe-in for it. And if Jake can sign them, it's a guaranteed contract with Callaway. The golf people Callaway? Gina asked, marrying the question Jake had asked earlier that morning. She was no more of a golf enthusiast than Jake, but she was a sports fan and would stop to watch if she saw a golfer she was familiar with playing on TV. Right, answered Jonathan. Anyway, Karen Blakely was sent out too, and now it's going to be a competition to see who will get him. Jake saw her, 
called me, and it didn't sound good when he hung up. Where is the tournament? A place called George Dunn National Golf Course. It's an oak forest. I wish he had a cell phone. Tell me about it, laughed Gina. Do you have one? Yes. Gina read off the number to Jonathan. Do you want me to go check on him? She asked. If you don't think that he'd get mad at me for calling you. I'll tell him I called you when you told me where he was. Great, said Jonathan. I'll be in my office all day. He read her his number. We've been watching the Chicago Marathon here. Have you caught any of it? I'm afraid you woke me up. We were out attempting to celebrate my birthday last night. Happy birthday. Anyway, some kid has a quarter-mile lead on the Kenyans, on pace to set some sort of record. Things fall through with Patterson. Maybe Jake can get up there and see if he can sign the kid. I'm sure we can use him for something. I'll mention it if I find him. Oak Forest, you said? Yeah, it's a little south of 159th Street off Central Avenue. It should be pretty easy to find on a map. I'll call you later. She hung up the phone and pulled the covers off her legs. Despite physical therapy, the muscles of her left leg were atrophied. Compared to her right leg, it looked like flesh-covered bones. She had injured the leg in a car accident as a child. The bones had been crushed and the nerves damaged. Since then, she had lived with a leg brace and a crutch. She had convinced herself that the injury made her less than a whole woman. Gina was otherwise attractive. Long dark hair and chocolate brown eyes with a figure that always got her second looks. It was the third look at her useless leg that turned guys off. She really couldn't blame them. When she met Jake, however, he seemed to pass over the presence of her brace and crutch. He had never made an issue of it and never patronized her by being overly helpful. They had only been dating a few weeks when a mugger attacked her as she left work late one night. Jake had been at the hospital when she awoke after three days of unconsciousness. The nurses said he never left her side. Her bad leg had prevented her from being able to escape her attacker, and it made her recovery difficult as well. Jake was there with encouragement and provided her with a reason to get better. She never forgot that. Gina had asked one time if her leg bothered him, if it was something he could live with. He had told her that if she could live with it, he certainly had no problem. She was scared that if she lost Jake, he was her last chance to find someone who could look past her imperfection. Jake was showing his imperfection as a human being, and coming to terms with what happened to Brad Finley was something no one could deal with overnight. She hoped that today would see him put things back on track. Maybe Andrew Patterson was the key to finding his way back to her. She stood, grabbed her crutch, and hobbled to the bathroom. She showered, washing her hair three times until she was sure the smoky smell was washed, or at least masked by the herbal essences shampoo. She fitted her brace onto her weakened leg, dressed, and did her face hurriedly. It would take her about half an hour to forty-five minutes to get to Oak Forest from her condo in Elmhurst. Jake, baby, hang on. I'll be there, she told him in a prayer. Hanover's leading? asked Carl Bateman from his golf cart, with the poster board sign taped on the side, designating it as an official tournament cart. He was talking to the old man in the yellow outfit, who had just finished updating the scores. Carl was a large man. He had never walked 18 holes in his life although he did walk nine once. Once. He wore a dark red blazer with the Niagara logo over the left breast pocket. A cell phone and walkie-talkie sat on the dashboard of the cart. Every few minutes, the walkie-talkie would crackle with updated hole-by-hole -hole scores. The best guy still haven't gone off, answered the man, but he's had a good round so far. Any chance he'll stay in it? asked Bateman. I doubt it bound to run into a double or triple bogey and sink down to the bottom. Too bad. Without Calkin, Patterson will just run away with this. What's wrong with Patterson? asked the scorekeeper. Carl rolled his eyes and the old man chuckled and answered his own question. He is a little strange. He nodded off to the parking lot. 
Did you notice the USA sports truck here? He asked. Yes, answered Carl with a little excitement. A little blurb on the nine o'clock report, especially with the tie-in to the Pro-Am Invitational, can't hurt. Well, they're not going to send out a crew for nothing. I'll take publicity any way we can get it. Our membership is down for the last three years running. This is the last chance for some great exposure. I just hope the tournament's not as boring as it looks like it might be. Well, it's a long day. I heard there's a sports agent around looking for Patterson. I know. His name is Jake Fisher. I set up his credentials. I heard it was a woman, retorted the scorekeeper. A woman? Yeah. Two agents at an amateur tournament? Maybe they know something we don't. Is she looking to sign someone or just looking? Where it is, she has an offer for Patterson even before he hits a ball. He must have been noticed by someone. Interesting, mused Carl. Well, I need to check on the starter. We're two minutes behind with the tee-off times. We need to keep this moving. By all means, agreed the scorekeeper sarcastically. Get those lazy bones to it. Thank you for listening to A Really Good Day, a novel by James Hosek, narrated by Rich Hosek. If you're interested in purchasing a hardcover edition of this story for yourself or a golfer in your life, visit jimbooks.myshopify.com. You'll get free shipping in the United States. You'll also get the complete audiobook and ebook editions with your purchase. And make sure to subscribe to the mailing list for updates about the upcoming release of his Doctor at Mystery series, Cozy Mysteries About a Crime Solving Veterinarian. Thanks again, and all the very best.